Hello again. So, I ended off my last video by saying this. I'm actually going to look at the sequel next, which can be believed to be a marked improvement. We'll see if that opinion holds. So yeah, this is that. Raised 2 was released in late 2011, a year and a half after the first game. As I mentioned, when I played this game as a kid, I definitely believed it to be the better of the two that existed at the time. I have no plans to review the third game right now because from what I can remember, it went in a completely different direction. Besides, there are some other games I want to talk about. Today, though, I must first admit that Kid Me was right, in a way. This game is, on every technical level imaginable, a better game. There are a few different progression systems which allow the player some degree of customization, and also give enemies different fighting styles that must be adapted to. The player can purchase and equip new weapons into their existing slots by equipment designed to offer passive buffs, and even a special ability which can be used periodically. The game looks better visually, feels a bit more fluid overall, and actually manages to make the world from the first game feel a bit more... alive. Now, as much as I'd like to judge this game by its own merits, the fact remains that it is a sequel. If a lot of my points sound like they're drawing comparisons to the first game, it's because they are. The basic formula of the game hasn't changed sufficiently for me to draw up a whole new review blueprint. Alright, let's get started. An intro cutscene. Or, I guess not really a cutscene, it's more of a slideshow. Plays, something we didn't get before, and actually looks pretty good. It recaps the tattered remains of story the first game left us. Several key points are clarified here. The alien invasion was defeated. Rays is the codename for the elite task force we were part of. Our character was infected with the zombie virus near the end of the human campaign, but so far has not turned. This is the first of many more features and design decisions that make it clear the story has been moved up significantly in terms of importance. I like what I see so far. Remember, even a halfway decent story can make up for flawed gameplay. The first mission introduces us to an important character, Johnny Rocket. I don't know why it's spelled like that either. Unlike Sergeant Johnson from the first game, this dude feels like an actual, fully functional character within the story. He introduces us to a couple of new mechanics, such as slippery terrain and activated abilities. Even the fact that we have in-game dialogue actually related to the story, as opposed to whatever the hell this was, is a massive step forward. In the first game, the only lore we got was in the level descriptions. I already feel more like a person in this world than I ever did before. During the tutorial, our headquarters is suddenly attacked by a giant missile, and a full-scale alien invasion immediately follows. Rather than a training dummy, our first trial by combat is against actual invaders. And so the learning feels not only more natural, but also more rewarding. We're actually doing something, we're helping. We're not just hanging out in VR while the world burns. The next mission begins the main thread of story that drives the entire chain of missions after it. Should probably mention that now, because again, the story has been developed and improved enough that every mission is actually connected to the one before it, and in turn to the overall chain. This is good, this is not something the first game had. Another new point. The team elimination game mode has been modified, so that each player has their own life count. This is outstanding, it means enemies actually stop spawning if they die too many times. It also means that your teammates are no longer a liability to your own life count outstanding decision, especially since this is still a single-player game and bots are all we have. Also, there can be more than two teams now, that's nice. Since we're on the topic of new things already, let's talk about that progression system. Rather than ten unique weapons, there are now seven weapon slots. In each slot, there are a few choices that the player can make, although I should also probably note that each choice other than the default for each slot costs credits. Essentially, the system doubles as both progression and customization. The purchasable weapons are not straight upgrades, they differ greatly, but all are viable. Aside from the weapons, there is also an activated ability slot. There are a few different choices for these, but the player begins with an ammo backpack. When the bar is full, the player can use the ability to immediately obtain one full magazine for whatever weapon they currently have in their hand. 
This is significantly stronger than it sounds, and it's what I end up using for most of the campaign. Now, while we're on the topic of ammo, I should probably note that the system in this game works a little differently than it did in the previous installment, or actually almost any game with a gun system. Instead of a spare ammo count that the player draws from to refresh their magazine, the player simply has a certain number of spare magazines. Reloading consumes one, and if you have no spares, you cannot reload. Ammo left in the magazine, if you reload before emptying the weapon, is not preserved. A much more realistic system than the typical game, and one that encourages frequent weapon switching. Since most weapons cannot hold more than two spare magazines, I honestly kinda like it. Gotta be disciplined, discourages habitual reloading. Finally, there are the equipment slots. There are three. One offers defensive abilities, such as increased HP or immunity to crits. But there is one in particular I'd like to point out, the adrenaline boost. This item means that if you are above 1 HP and take damage that would otherwise kill you, you will be reduced to 1 HP instead. This item is quite good, but doesn't come into play until later, I simply wanted to introduce it now, as it is quite important further down the line. The other two slots offer utility and offensive bonuses. This includes things such as power-up boosters and weapon stabilizers, but overall isn't too interesting. Moving on, the next mission has us play as a different character in a flashback, again demonstrating this game's dedication to its story. Our character, Captain Biggs, was transporting some robots when his ship was abruptly shot down by an alien craft. The aliens fled Earth after the first invasion failed and have not been heard from since, so this was quite unexpected. However, Biggs' craft managed to also shoot down the alien ship as well, and together they both crash land on an isolated planet. After defeating the alien survivors, we discover a set of artifacts in the wreckage of their ship, although Biggs has to leave them there because the escape pod isn't large enough. After returning to Earth, Biggs notifies the remnants of Rays, that's us by the way, who in turn take another ship back to that planet and recover the artifacts. All of this is done under the assumption that the recent alien assault on Earth was an attempt to recover these artifacts, which they believed us to possess. In fact, we recovered the artifacts with the full intention to return them and end the war before it could begin in earnest. However, this mindset is shattered a few missions later. After fighting off multiple waves of aliens attacking various research facilities, our scientists finally discover the purpose of these artifacts. They are in fact force field generators, capable of coming together to form an impenetrable barrier. The aliens were apparently attempting to use these artifacts to protect their home planet from an oncoming meteor barrage using a planet-sized shield. However, these meteors are also threatening Earth. And since the artifacts are already in our possession, I mean, you know. I should also mention that during this time, we get a couple of new additions to our squad. They aren't huge characters by any means, but it's nice to actually know a little bit about them. Unlike our squad from the first game, these character decisions are actually reflected in-game fairly well. Our explosives and fire expert, for example, skips out on a mission at the underwater lab because he is afraid of the ocean. In fact, a lot of stuff happens in-game, during the missions, that proves the experience was actually created with some level of thought and attention to detail. For example, in this mission, the zombies spawn in one at a time instead of all at once, making it feel like we are being gradually swarmed as more are drawn to the fighting. In this mission, we must first face the enemy alone, but our team arrives eventually and turns the tide of what would have otherwise been an excessively difficult task. In this mission, in the Alien campaign, these robots malfunction halfway through the battle and must reboot, meaning they all stand still and do not attack for a few critical seconds. It's little touches like this that really make the missions feel like a part of the story, rather than the story simply being tacked on. That's not to say the gameplay itself hasn't received major improvements either. Aside from the weapons feeling more responsive and fun to play with, the new customization allows for different strategies and approaches to countering difficult enemies. Innovation on the part of the player, you know? Perhaps most important, however, is that these new customization options also allow the enemies to be made more challenging by something other than simple manipulation of numbers. Number fuckery is almost entirely absent. The enemies don't just randomly get more HP over the course of the campaign. Enemies actually fight differently, which forces the player to counter them. This is the true advantage of the single-player format. 
the game does this really well. Johnny Rocket, for example, has a katana and an old-fashioned lever-action shotgun. Our demolitions guy uses all kinds of grenades and fire weaponry. These aliens have cloaking devices and beam weapons. Their equipment reflects who they are, how they prefer to fight, and most importantly, create a more unique challenge than simply inflating the health bar. Most of the remaining missions in the human campaign revolve around us attempting to place the artifacts in the designated locations to create a shield that will protect the planet from the meteors, while all the while the aliens attack us in droves. There is one mission, however, where we get a 1v1 with the alien commander. Although we are unsuccessful in defeating him, this mission serves its purpose admirably. It introduces him as a character. None of the aliens in the first game were actual characters because they didn't speak a language we understood, even when we were playing as them. This is not the case this time. This somewhat pelagic-looking commander taunts us, in English, the entire time. It's a great fight. In the end, we succeed. The final mission takes place in the shadow of the looming meteors, but our force field goes up just in time. A decisive victory, yeah? Huh, let's see what the Alien Campaign has to say about that. Just like the first game, the Alien Campaign is hard mode. Nothing we do seems to deter the humans. First, we are unable to retrieve the artifacts from the ship, then we can't stop the humans from finding them, and so on. Now, I will admit that it is somewhat frustrating to decisively win the match, only for the game to tell me, in a slideshow cutscene, that I was unsuccessful. This is a somewhat irritating video game trope, and seeing it here frankly pisses me off a little bit. However, it does sort of make sense. After all, this is the same story from the other side, and we won all of those battles playing as the humans, so this outcome is to be expected, I suppose. The Alien campaign does not take place in a different timeline or anything. Anyway, in the Alien missions, we play as that fishy commander we encounter only briefly from the human side. Our alien teammates, while nameless, are actually characters in this game. Battlefield conversations offer some level of insight into how the alien army functions. Our commander, for one, is quite talkative and quite cocky. The player character from the human campaign, referred to simply as the Ray's Soldier, is our primary antagonist, and his loadout and weapons reflect this quite well. He is made a threat simply by his equipment and skill rather than any sort of number fuckery. For one thing, he has that adrenaline boost item I was talking about earlier, meaning he effectively counters most one-shot weapons like the rocket launcher. The rocket launcher, by the way, which he himself uses to devastating effect. He also has the ability to briefly deploy a protective shield, which can be kind of a pain. It's very interesting to see our own sailing protagonist made into such a captivating enemy by way of his actions. Anyway, as I was saying, most of our alien missions follow our squad as we attempt, in increasing desperation, to recover our stolen artifacts and save our planet. We get to witness the 1v1 in the desert from the other side, which is incredibly cool, actually. Beginning with this mission, though, things take a turn. The difficulty spikes dramatically, and although this is something that also happened in the last game, I will just come out and say that Race 2 is significantly harder. Importantly, though, this difficulty isn't due to just numbers. The enemies have the same stats they always have. The difficulty is mainly due to how they play. This mission is Capture the Flag, a game mode new to this installment. The player's team must make their way to the enemy flag and bring it back to their own ten times before the enemy can do the same. On this mission, we are outnumbered four to three. I notice that my teammates have a tendency to play very passively, usually preferring to stand guard on our own flag than go for an attack. However, they are not particularly effective in combat, which leaves me with a difficult decision. Play defense myself, sometimes having to hold off the entire enemy team of four on my own while my teammates struggle to carry the enemy flag for even a few feet. Or do I play offensively, bum-rushing the enemy flag over and over and praying that my team can hold the others off. Another problem is that the enemy team has enough people to effectively attack and defend at the same time, an advantage we do not have. There is a massive amount of difficulty in this problem, and I struggle with it for some time, but when I finally do succeed it felt real. My frustration was myself, not the game. The victory is somewhat undercut by this cutscene telling me I failed anyway, but still. The next few missions are also quite hard, but nothing to write home about, but then... Oh god, the final mission. 
probably should have mentioned this sooner, but in this final mission, the race soldier has finally succumbed to the zombie virus. He has, however, somehow remained in control of his mental faculties, making him an incredible threat. Unappropriate enough, final boss. But god damn it, you are so close, so close to making a game free of number fuckery. I would have no problems with this fight if his increased HP was all there was to it, but this mission takes place right before the meteors hit. There is a time limit. At exactly 4 minutes and 5 seconds, we lose automatically. During that time, we have to kill this enhanced race soldier 10 times. That's once every 24 seconds. Sometimes it takes me longer than that just to find him again. Not to mention all the other humans we have to kill as well. This fight is difficult on a purely mathematical level, and it makes me angry. Number fuckery is back. I sit here for hours. I have like six hours of unused footage of this fight. At some point, I switch to using the same energy bubble item the Ray Soldier has, and this proves to be my salvation. It is way easier to get this dude to kill himself with his own rockets than it is to actually kill him legitimately. And finally, finally I get lucky. While I lay dying on the ground with only four seconds left on the clock, this idiot fires a rocket into the ceiling right above himself and burns his last life. I had one. And goddamn, was this story twist worth the wait. All this time, we had been fighting to recover our artifacts, but it turns out that was never the plan at all. Once us aliens realized our home planet was doomed, we instead decided to evacuate to Earth. A good chunk of our population was able to successfully relocate undetected, and when the shield went up and the humans rejoiced, we celebrated too. In saving themselves, they had also saved us, and we were closer than ever to our desired conquest. <laughs> All right, I should probably wrap this up. This game is a lot better. Combat feels unique every time due to the constantly changing enemy loadouts, and the story is about 10 steps up from where it was before. I'm not even nearly as mad as I should be about that final fight reverting to number fuckery, because that twist still gets me. Not a world-class story, it's true, but who said it had to be? I liked it. The game complemented it well. And that's about all I have to say. Final verdict? Mostly really good. Okay. I'm out of here. I will make another one of these Flash game reviews soon, but not the third game, as I said earlier. I'm gonna go somewhere completely different. Find a new place to look, you know? And until then, this is Jake, keeping my promise to nobody, signing off.